So, I got to church this morning, and I, and I have another one of these on my desk. And I thought, what do I want to do? And so I thought about, um, I want to talk about the living and the risen Jesus. And in the Bible, we know the Bible is a reliable historical document. In fact, it's more reliable than any other text that there is. And more and more, it just seems like every week something else happens to prove science wrong and the Bible right. To prove the thought process of other people wrong and the Bible right. And it's been that way since the giddy up of everything. And we'll go back to the historical record of the New Testament. The gospel, the four gospels give detailed eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, eyewitness accounts are important. Because today, if you went out and saw somebody stab somebody or shoot somebody or, or, you know, abduct anyone or anything happens, if you saw that, you could go to court as an eyewitness to that event. And the court would swear you in under oath and you're a reliable witness at that point. There's enough reliable witnesses that saw Jesus Christ after death that if you went to court today, that he, the verdict would be affirmative. He rose. People saw him, and that's just the way it is. Um, but there's no record. Now, now listen, this is, this is really cool. There is no record of anyone ever coming forward to dispute or deny that Jesus was witnessed. Now, the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas and those people, they, they put out stories that, oh, you know, they, they were stole the body, they did this, they did that. But they never contradict the fact that over 500 people saw a risen Christ. They never, the, the people that hated Jesus the most with the Romans never contradicted contradicted. The fact that Jesus Christ was seen after burial alive. And he wasn't just seen alive. He preached to the apostles, stressed that he had risen, but there's no, there, there's still no record yet to this day of anyone ever disputing it. Now the apostle Paul states that many people saw the risen Christ. On one occasion, over 500 people saw him at once. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 8. Many of these I went, now here, here's another important part. You know, you have hearsay, you have this, that, or another. Many of these witnesses were still alive when Paul wrote this letter. It was 25 years after the resurrection. They were still living when the crucifixion and the resurrection occurred. They could have at any time went to anybody, the Romans, the Sanhedrin, Good God, they could have went to the noise stone press and said, this isn't true. I didn't see him. But not one single person stood up and said, I never saw him. You know why? Because they were scared to. They were afraid to contradict the truth when it came to Jesus Christ. They were afraid of the consequences. The apostles, Paul wrote those letters to the Corinthians, we know his readers accepted and believed Jesus without reservation. Again, because it was still in their lifetime. A lot of the books in the Bible were written after Jesus' death. Years, hundreds of years. This one was still while the people were alive. They saw him. They walked with him. They knew him. And they saw him after resurrection. That's enough proof. That, that on itself is enough proof. Psalm 16, you will not leave my soul in shalom, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 16.10, Jewish rabbinical tradition believes that the passage was speaking of the Messiah, which preaches to the Jews. Paul used Psalm 16.10 as an example of the Old Testament prophecy fulfilled by the resurrection of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the Messiah. Now you've got traditions of the empty tomb. Story. People, oh, that's just a story. Christians made up this story. The tomb is just a legend. Never happened. 
See, that goes against solid historical evidence. Remember, there were many non-Christian eyewitnesses of the crucifixion. Here's a key point. Non-Christian. They didn't believe until they saw him. They were there. They were the ones saying, oh, no, 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 that too, no, no, wrong tomb. That's another theory. They witnessed it. And they witnessed the burial of the Nazarene, including Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers who absolutely just wanted this Jesus thing to go away. They searched for a body. Are you aware of that? They literally went out to a crucifixion site where they just threw people on top of people on top of people and threw lime on them to cover up part of the smell. They went out there and they started bringing up bodies that had been crucified to get people to try to prove one of them was Jesus so they could show these Christ followers that he really died and here's his body. He was really crucified. But they couldn't find it. You know why? Because it wasn't there. He's risen. There are no bones in the tomb. There are no bones in the grave. There are no bones in some big pit covered with lye that had any stamp of Jesus Christ on them. They're not there because he rose. Not only did he rise, he's here today. Well, I don't know that you know if Jesus is walking the earth or not. Why not? Why don't I know that? Critics, Jesus didn't really die. He only fainted or temporarily lost consciousness. But later he revived and recovered in the tomb. So let me th let's think about this one. <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gets 39 whacks with the, <laughs> with the cat of nine tails. It rips the skin off his body. He's beating profusely. He's got a crown on his head. He's bleeding from his head profusely. He carries his cross. He's got nails in his wrists. He's got nails in his, in his ankles. And good God Almighty, they pierced his side until water and blood both came out. And then they thumped him on the ground, took the nails out, wrapped him in a cloth, and buried him in a tomb. And you're trying to tell me that some common sense theologist person is trying to say within three days he healed enough to walk. For real? That must have been the strongest Neosporin in the history of Neosporin. It is absurd to think that a guy was tortured, crucified, pronounced dead, wrapped in grave clothes, could not only survive, but recover enough in three days to walk on his own. Next explanation. They stole the body. Jesus' disciples stole the body. How could a small group of frightened men pull this off? Because they were scared to death and ran. A heavy, noisy stone closed the opening of the tomb. It was over a ton. It took four men to roll it on there. It was guarded by the Roman soldiers who were told, if anything happens to this, you're going to die. It was stamped with the Roman steel, seal. And what you don't know about the Roman seal, <clears throat> it was illegal to break into a sealed tomb with the Roman stamp on it. You know what the penalty was? Death. Death. Would men who ran away in fear when Jesus was arrested Sunday became courageous enough to steal his body from a tomb that was guarded heavily by Roman soldiers? No. Furthermore, all but one of the disciples were eventually killed, that's John, was it, for being followers of Jesus. Would they have been willing to give up their lives if they knew the, the resurrection was a complete hoax? Would they give up their lives knowing that Jesus didn't really rise? Would they give up their lives being skinned alive, speared, beheaded, and crucified for a lie? No. That is just simple and plain the answer. No. They were afraid and knew that they had to admit what really happened. 
But they also knew they were glory bound. They were headed to the kingdom. That's what they knew. Bible or People say that the apostles were slow-witted, uneducated peasants, and that they went to the wrong tomb. Well, it's kind of hard to do when Mary, well, they witnessed it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I must have took a left at Albuquerque. I, I, you know, I went, went to the wrong stone house. Fred wasn't there, but Barney was. Stoned. They were stone drunk. They hallucinated the guard. They only thought they saw a resurrected Jesus. If true, then the empty tomb would have been had to have been a hallucination as well. Why didn't the Jewish leader stop that rumor when they had seen a risen Christ by producing the body of Jesus? More than 500 time, people at one time, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, saw the risen Jesus after resurrection. Could all 500 of them have been stone drunk? No. No. The answer is no. They told the truth. They told what they saw. The Apostle Thomas, you know the term doubting Thomas. We get that because Thomas doubted. Even when they said we saw him, he doubted. I won't believe until I touch his holes. I won't believe until I put my fingers in his side. I won't believe. Doubt, 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 doubt. Hey, knock, knock. Who is it? Jesus. Oh. Oh, Thomas, by the way, give me your fingers. Here's my wrist. Do you believe now? Yes, Lord, I believe. He believed to his death because it's true. He said it's a spiritual resurrection, not a bodily resurrection. Here's the problem with that. The Bible tells us if it was spiritual... Could somebody walk into a room? No. Could somebody literally sit at a table and eat with you after they died by spirit? No. Jesus ate with the disciples. He walked with the disciples. He was there with the disciples. They saw him ascend to heaven on a cloud. It was witness after witness after witness. There's no way. It was hallucinated, unless they were all drinking the same Mexican mushroom juice in Jerusalem 2,100 years ago. Paul of Tarsus was a brilliant young Jewish rabbi. He was completely convinced that Christianity was a hearsay. However, after a dramatic interaction with the living Jesus, he became Paul, the Christian apostle, and a leader opponent of Christianity. This man possessed one of the finest minds in history, and he was well-versed in the prophecies of the Jewish scripture. He became fully converted and convinced. When he was on the road to Damascus, I did a sermon about 11 or 12 years ago that said, can I have five minutes of your time? When he was on the road to Damascus on the horse, the thunder hit, the horse bucked, Paul fell. That thunder was the voice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That lightning showed his image of his body. Paul lost sight. Scales over his eyes. He was scared to death. And then he hears God. He hears our Lord Jesus. He says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of whom you're persecuting. And good God Almighty, he was. He was the living God. He showed who he needed. He took the sinners of all chief by self proclaimed he was. He took him and put him in his hand and said, Paul, I'm going to use you. I need you to convert these people. I need you to let the Gentiles know they're just as important as the Jews. I want you to tell the world that I have risen. And this is what I say. Go to a street named Straight. Find Ananias, tell him to baptize you, the scales come off, then you go, you go preach the gospel, you spread it to nations. And then they had to counsel Jerusalem with James. And they sat down, and the other apostles were against Paul. You're not Jewish. 
you're not Jewish. Paul looks at him and shakes his hands, and he says, Jesus is rightfully my Lord as well as yours because he came to me for me to reconcile this with everyone. Jesus is a Jesus of the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus is the Jesus of all races and all nations. Jesus is the Jesus and the Lord of all countries. Come together. Bind together with the same yoke. And go spread the message. But he didn't, he didn't say, go spread this like the Jewish people do. He wanted Paul to go out and reach the unreachable. Paul became the voice of the voiceless for the Gentiles. If it wasn't for the Apostle Paul in that day in Damascus, we wouldn't be in this church today. We wouldn't be. He made it possible for us to worship our living God. He made it possible that we could all come here together and fellowship. Now with the Bible, the early Christians never questioned actually the historical records of the New Testament. And there's no evidence that the New Testament was ever rewritten. They found scrolls that are original in that time frame like like Paul's. They weren't rewritten over. They're writing letters, uh, commentaries, and written church services all attest to the resurrection. These documents form a continuous overlapping chain that links early Christian writings back to the apostles, not just man. It goes back to the apostles. So I'm going to just end this with this. God made it possible that we could all be together. God made it possible for us to forgive. God made it possible for us not to dwell. God made it possible for us to love everyone. God made it possible for us to prosper. God made it possible for us to live because Jesus paid it all for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever comes through me. Amen? Jesus says, I am the way. It didn't say, well, the Pope will be the vicar. You can go through him. We go through the Father to get to the Son. Or we go through the Son to get to the Father. That's how it's been since the giddy up of the Bible. We pray to Jesus, one, because we believe it. Two, because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Three, he is our Lord and Savior. And four, the impossible becomes possible with God. Amen? We know how we do. This side says, if Jesus was in this building right now, and he is, he would hear us loudly say, God bless you guys.